don't know about any of you, but based off of the way this past offseason played out, I did not have high expectations for the New York Giants, and I don't think a lot of other people did too. And I've talked about it on several occasions, but just to surmise really quickly what I've talked about before. You're a team that's really bad, but you insist on paying Peyton Manning, or excuse me, Eli Manning. It doesn't matter, he's washed up as his 2015 version of his brother. Nonetheless, you insist on paying Eli Manning out of loyalty, I guess, and one more go. So that would indicate that you're kind of in a win-now mode. But as a team being in a win-now mode, who already passed up on the opportunity to take a quarterback in the 2018 draft, you took a quarterback six overall in the 2019 draft, then bringing in both that young quarterback and still having the veteran in Eli Manning, indicating you're still thinking potentially about winning now, you have now drafted a guy six overall that's going to have zero impact if things had actually worked out with Eli this year. Then you go on and trade uh, your best offensive weapon in Odell Beckham Jr. for a first and third round pick. Like This is just the kind of stuff that absolutely makes no sense. Like, which one is it? Are you all in, or are you ready to rebuild? And even, like, looking at it just from a judgment standpoint, like, how did you look at Eli Manning and think he was going to last a whole year as a starter? And if you didn't think he was going to last a whole year as a starter, why did you keep him at all? Why did you just give away all that money? Again, it felt like out of loyalty and unneeded loyalty at that for no reason. That's what it looked like. So heading into this season, I really didn't have much hope or expectations for the Giants, and they certainly lived up to that. Uh, and then you bring in Golden Tate in part to replace some of Odell Beckham Jr.'s production. Of course, he suspended the first four games for a PED violation. Uh, then you get off to that bad 0-2 start, and then they end up switching to Daniel Jones anyways and immediately win the next two games. which just kind of validated the whole point of Eli was really bad those first two games. You lost both of them. If you had even close to somewhat competent quarterback play, you could have potentially won one or both of those early games and imagine how different the season's vibe might have been. Um... So then you end up switching to Daniel Jones anyways and proceed to win your next two games. Yes, they weren't exactly banner opponents by any stretch of the imagination, but still, wins are wins. And Daniel Jones got wins in his first two NFL starts. But then, of course, reality kind of set in. This team is not good. They lost Saquon Barkley for a few games due to injury, and they lost their next nine games. And as you would expect with a lot of rookie quarterbacks, and Daniel Jones especially being a guy they questioned just how high his ceiling was and some of the issues he had with ball security at Duke. They crept into uh, the works here as well. He had some moments that were very good, like comeback victory against Tampa Bay being one of them for his first start, his first win as an NFL starting quarterback. But he really struggled with ball security. He had 13 starts, 23 turnovers. So not only uh, did he have some injury problems, you're talking about a guy that turn the ball over a ton. You had Saquon get over a thousand yards rushing while missing three games. You know, so you look at it again and you say, okay, you took this guy number two overall. He is a stud. He is everything has been as advertised. But in two years that you've had this guy, you've done nothing with it. It's kind of a shame. Uh, the defense was also very bad. 20th, 8th against the pass, 20th in total yards allowed. They had 11 games where they allowed 28 or more points. So to sum up, your defense was getting shredded, giving up a ton of yardage and a ton of points, and your quarterback turned the ball over 23 times. Your young quarterback. How do you think your season went? <laughs> Not very well. Yet somehow, some way, Pat Shermer is the only guy to take the fall here. Now look, I don't know that I was huge on the Pat Shermer hire to begin with. I honestly can't really remember. I don't remember it striking a lot of true inspiration. If you look at Pat Shermer... He was 9-23 and in his previous head coaching stint in Cleveland. Was he the type of guy that really struck you as being that type of dude? Eh, I don't know. Was he, did he really strike you as a leader of men and a guy that could really truly take command and charge of an organization? No. Which is why he went 9-23 and his two years in New York, and he was shown the door. But somehow Dave Gettleman still has a job. Like He's the one that hired the head coach that he fired after two seasons, which admit is him admitting he got it wrong. He didn't know what the hell he was doing. Then he comes here, and you see how you handled the Odell Beckham stuff, and just da-da-da, and you look at it, and you're like, it doesn't seem like he knows what the hell he's doing. There's no real plan or vision here, which a lot of media and a lot of fans are calling out talking about because they were right. And yet somehow Dave Gettleman still has his job. Wonders never cease to me. 
the guys that don't draft well and hire the wrong head coach get to stay longer than the head coaches. I don't know. But anyways, looking ahead to 2020, let's look first at the 2019 draft class because Lord knows when it comes to this Giants team, based off of the tail end, specifically the Jerry Reese era and then into the Dave Gettleman era, you're going to need some type of impact to come out of this 2019 draft class, which is when you sit back and think about it. All of the first-round picks of the Giants from 2010 to 2015 are no longer with the organization. No longer with the organization. And if I remember correctly, Eli Apple was 2016. He's not with the organization either. Now, that doesn't mean they were all busts. Jason Pierre-Paul certainly was not a bust. David Wilson most certainly was. So not every first-round pick that's no longer with the team was a bust. Nonetheless, what that means is, is those premium marquee picks that you're expecting to be impact players and difference makers, building blocks of what you do. Everybody from 2010 to 2016 no longer with the organization. And the ones that they've got, Evan Engram can't stay on the field. Saquon Barkley's a stud, but is he so much more of a stud than any other number of running backs that were taken in the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh rounds? So, yeah, they're going to need a lot out of this 2019 draft class, or Dave Gettleman will be showing the door pretty quickly, too. And when you look at the class, Daniel Jones, jury's still obviously going to be out. Dexter Lawrence, I think he'll be a really good player. I don't know if he was worth the 17th overall pick of the draft, personally. DeAndre Baker had some ups and downs, but I think he was putting it together as the year went along. Um, so I would expect better things out of him to come. Uh, Oshane Jimenez, you know, he had a few sacks. He's a guy that I could see doing a little bit more in the years to come. Julian Love, I think another guy that fits into the rotation long term in that secondary. Darius Slayton was a steal in the fifth round. Absolutely love that pick. Corey Ballantine in the sixth round. He was a guy that got a lot of action. I don't know if it's so much due to talent more than situation and Jordan Horace Jenkins being cut and all of this other stuff. Bottom line is, is they're going to need plenty of these guys to contribute in a big, big way because otherwise it's not going to get any better for the Giants anytime soon. Heading into the offseason, they've got $70 million in cap space. Could potentially clear up easily another $10 million or so more if they want to cut Kareem Martin and Rhett Ellison. You know, Kareem Martin... You can get out of that contract. He's not giving you much. Why pay him that money if you don't have to? Cut your losses now. Red Ellison, you might keep him, but do you really want to be paying him, what is it, like $7 million next year to be a role-playing tight end? And if you're saying, well, you got to have some security there in case Evan Ingram gets hurt again, well, then if anything, that tells you, A, that you don't want Evan Ingram long-term, and that, B, maybe you're better off drafting another option. Just saying. Um, but they've got some free agents they got to figure out. Eli Manning, you would assume he's not going to be back. Whether he's going to be a starter anywhere else or play anywhere else or he's going to retire remains to be seen. Uh, Leonard Williams, here was a guy that they gave up a third-round pick to get, which the story is talking about how Dave Gettleman doesn't really seem to understand how compensatory picks work. It is striking and, again, speaks to the guy potentially being in over his head. Um, but Leonard Williams, they traded for him. He didn't do squat for him. So, if you bring him back, how much are you really willing to invest in him? Marcus Golden had a good season. He's a guy that I would think would be, you know, somebody that they're going to prioritize retaining. Mike Remmers probably putting a little bit of priority on wanting to keep him, especially for your young quarterback. You need some protection up front. Uh, Michael Thomas, you know, they'll probably bring him back as well. But even when you look at it, you say, ugh, you know, they traded a third round pick for Leonard Williams, got nothing out of him, really, and they didn't. So they're going to have to hit again big on this draft. And do you really trust Dave Gettleman to hit big on the draft? I don't know. They've got the fourth overall pick, no third round pick because, again, of the Leonard Williams deal. So you got picks in rounds one, two, four, five, six, and a couple of seventh rounders to boot. What does this team really need to be able to turn the corner and help Daniel Jones' development and get back in the mix in the NFC least? Well, there are a few things. Number one, wide receiver. You can't just trade away Odell Beckham Jr.'s production and expect everything's going to be okay, especially if you don't have viable options waiting in the wings. Now, maybe they'll get something even more out of Darius Slayton, but he was a guy taken in the fifth round, but you have to like what you saw with the opportunities he got in 2019. 
Now, what's Sterling Shepard going to be? Are you going to bring Golden Tate back? Bottom line is they need a number one wide receiver. And picking at pick four, they could potentially see an opportunity where you're looking at team need matches the talent on the board. Uh, Jerry Judy from Alabama, C.D. Lamb from Oklahoma, potentially. Guys that you could be talking about for this. I mean, you're talking about, again, for a Dave Gettleman, you're talking about for this organization. Um, you know, last two drafts, you take a Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones. There's not an aversion to take an offensive skill players high in the draft, and it might be time to take one. Um, but defensively, they could also really, really use an impact edge rusher. Uh, unfortunately for them, they're probably just out of the range of Chase Young. Um, frankly, I think they're so bad they could use some help on the interior of that line too, uh, which might suggest somebody like Derek Brown if he's there, and he might make a lot of sense. But maybe they would roll the dice on somebody like Epineza from Iowa. I don't really know. Uh, you could also argue that offensive tackle is still a need. Like when you look at it, are you really confident with Nate Solder and the contract that you're giving him for the production that he gives you? Do you really want to pay Mike Remmers big money to come back? Um, I don't know. You look at tight end. You know, when Evan Engram's healthy, he can make a difference. But the problem is he can't stay healthy. He's kind of like Jordan Reed. Great when he's in, but he's not in enough for it to really matter. It's just all one big tease. Uh, so I don't know if that necessarily comes via the draft or necessarily even comes... Uh, early in the draft, it might come via free agency, pursuing somebody like an Austin Hooper or somebody like that. Um, but they got to find another option at tight end, and then they need some help at corner. Um, you've traded away Eli Apple last season. This season, you released Janoris Jenkins. You got to find some other guys there in the secondary. 2020 will be a notable season for the Giants because you're going to find out a lot about Daniel Jones's development. You're going to find out about this 2019 draft class and the 2020 draft class, and you're going to look and say, hey, even Dave Gettleman was doing some things right after all, and it just took a while for it to show. Or as bad as things look now, they're going to get a whole lot worse. And frankly, I don't know which direction they're heading, but at the moment, it doesn't look very good.